Many of the incoming foreign radio broadcasts were heavily jammed by the Soviet Union for 40 years with this electronically generated noise, which overwhelmed the voices coming from Munich, London, Cologne, Washington, Jerusalem, Beijing, and Tirana. industrial interference is. A truck with a faulty ignition system passes by, causes a car radio to buzz. Radio and television reception may be badly affected by various home electrical appliances or cellular phones. Unwanted signals radiated by high voltage lines, trams, trolleys, electric trains, and even low-flying planes are traveling even greater distances. Fortunately, these problems last only a few minutes. In civilized countries, interference sources are quickly detected and eliminated by telecommunication control bodies. Many of us could hardly imagine that radio noise could persecute millions of radio listeners every day, decade after decade. This film is about intentionally produced radio noise, which had its source spread from Havana to Moscow, from Tehran to Beijing. This is jamming, a censorship of radio broadcasting. A couple of countries have extensively used radio wave bearers in the 20th century. Special networks of jamming stations have been erected. Their purpose was to block out radio broadcast of politically unwanted content. There is a saying that in order to realize that one is stupid, there must be a clever person nearby. Everything comes with comparison. In order to understand that all official speeches were absurd, in order to check if you were still in your sober mind, in order to stay still a personality, it was absolutely necessary to listen to something different, to something worse. But sometimes to somebody, it might have seemed that the official speeches were not so absurd. In the 20s, Berlin jammed the radio telegraph traffic between Paris and St. Petersburg. It could be that jamming is a German invention. The first use of broadcast jamming occurred in the late 20s. Moscow-based radio Comintern was jammed by Germany. In the 30s, the USSR jammed Romanian radio. Austria defended itself against the Nazi propaganda. The massive jamming started in the Soviet Union in 1948 against the programs of the BBC and the Voice of America. Jamming operations in the Eastern European countries were expanded in 1951 when Radio Free Europe started transmissions and in 1953 when Radio Liberation went on air in Munich. The Western point of view could be illustrated by this quote from an article by Jamie Frederick Metzel. The U.S. government maintained its strong distinction between civilian and military use of radio jamming technology. While jamming was appropriate on or around the battlefield, it was not appropriate outside the military arena, and any interference with these transmissions was a breach of international law in terms of both specific radio conventions and broader rights of free expression. The Soviets had quite a different understanding. To them, state sovereignty precluded such undesirable foreign transmissions, and jamming was a legitimate and often used countermeasure. The Soviet network of jamming stations was created and developed by decisions of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. The construction work was performed by enterprises of the Ministry of Communications. In their documents, jamming was called radio defense from anti-Soviet radio broadcast and considered to be a matter of extreme importance. Local party authorities in Soviet republics showed the initiative as well. For instance, Moscow's governor in Lithuania, Antanas Shnitskus, insisted on urgent construction of additional jamming stations. In my youth, 
all my Jewish friends would listen to the voices from the West. By the way, only a very few of the programs were from Israel, but most commonly to Radio Liberty and the Voice of America. To listen to Liberty was quite difficult, but the Voice of America at certain times was not jammed because of so-called detente or certain agreements. Radio Liberty was a surrogate radio, and it was jammed all the time. As far as I can remember, in our home, the radio was always on. It was an old tube set. It was my grandfather, my father, and later me who followed the tradition who would listen to it. It was only much later that I realized how important it was in my future life. Vitautis Latukas, deceased, worked for 33 years as manager of object number 603 in Kaunas, Lithuania. He remembered that after World War II, the receiving post used for many years the AR-88 type American-made receivers for tracking of the jamming targets and the BC-610 type shortwave transmitters. Jammers, just like everything in the USSR, were short of spare parts. The object number 603 had a shortage of filaments for vacuum tubes, test equipment, and wires for the antennas. Some of the transmitters operated for 20 years with no major overhaul and were in danger of falling apart at any time. Stanley Leonvold, a veteran of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, writes in his article, the Soviet jamming system was administered by a secret department in the Ministry of Communications. Privately, the department was known as the Krestyaninova service after Natalia Krestyaninova, who organized and headed the department for more than 25 years. The service was responsible for about 5,000 people and more than 2,000 jamming transmitters. Romantis Plekis, author of the book Jamming, describes the sounds which were used for emitting of radio interference. From 1951 until 1989, there were four types of jamming signals invented by the institutes in Moscow. The most aggressive electronic noise was used against Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, Radio Tirana, and the Voice of Israel. This sound was produced by generators of jamming effect. In 1964, Soviets started to jam with the Mayak radio program. It was severely distorted because of transmission in the FM mode. This signal blocked programs of the BBC, The Voice of America, and Deutsche Welle. Since 1976, all jamming sounds have been replaced by the speech resembling signal. It was composed of short segments of the Radio Moscow's announcers and sounded like a buzz of crowd and was psychologically annoying. Besides that, it prevented the possibility of filtering the jammed radio program. The sound was reproduced by using reel-to-reel -reel tape decks or special disc players. There are also other jamming signals around the world. Cuba is jamming Radio Marti with a swinging carrier. China jams with national music.
Telecommunications Union performed four monitoring sessions between 1984 and 1986. 95% of Russian language broadcast of The Voice of America, the BBC, Deutsche Welle, and The Voice of Israel were found to have been jammed. Radio Liberty's broadcasts were 100% jammed. Listeners in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East were asked to report any interference caused by jamming. Reports showed that, for example, Radio Yugoslavia averaged about 90% interference and Radio Vatican averaged 65% interference as a result of jamming directed at other broadcasters. Most of the jammers contributing to this third-party interference were found to be located in the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, and Czechoslovakia. to 1960, an especially wild method of jamming was used in the Soviet Union. In big cities during the night break, the medium wave broadcasting transmitters were tuned to the intermediate frequency of receivers. This result was a total blockage of all radios on all bands near the jamming station, including the Soviet programs. Alvin Snyder writes in his book, Warriors of Disinformation, Russian language programs of the Voice of America, the BBC, and Deutsche Welle were jammed selectively on instructions that were sent to the regional jamming centers from Moscow. When the central monitoring station heard an anti-Soviet text, such as news about Soviet dissidents or someone being sentenced in a political trial, it issued a command to switch on the transmitters. Selective jamming was complicated and inefficient, therefore it was ended in 1963. Since then, all foreign radio stations to be censored were jammed on all frequencies and at all times of transmission. For 40 years, Eric Wissner was a manager of the Lampertgeim radio station in West Germany, which transmitted programs of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. My feelings about the jamming that we know from the information we had that some of the jamming would uh, take us completely away, but there is, as, far, uh, as I know, the propagation that it is not possible to jam everything at every time, and we use that, and that was one of the reasons why we have repeated programs several times, and we have quite a large target area, the entire Soviet Union with all the different languages. Radio Liberty was at the, my job at the beginning, and uh, they had the Russian, Yellow-Russian, Ukrainian, all the national languages, a great number, all totally together. There was up to 30 at some time, the Caucasian language, and later came in uh, some time in the 70s, the Baltic languages. But there was is definitely a time in the morning where uh, interested listeners could find a time of 10 to 15 minutes where jamming was low or not noticeable. I would not say not noticeable at all, but uh, our signal was readable and the jamming was down to a level where it didn't affect, comp or it didn't affect our transmissions too much. Of course, we don't, didn't have the precise number of jammers, uh, not counting the hundreds or thousands of local jammers which were in the low power area between 500, uh, uh, 5 kilowatts and 500 watts. Some of them, uh, that's very difficult to, if you, this is not much, was, no, will not amount too much power, but there were also skywave jammers which were high power and uh, we estimated that they spend about three to four times as power as we use on our side. A 
unique story was the Polish service of Radio Free Europe. From 1951 to 1956, several hundred low-power jamming transmitters operated within Poland. This network was superimposed by the Soviet long-range jammers. The Soviet bloc countries cooperated in the field of cross-border radio censorship. The typical jamming pattern was that of extensive coverage of a country with interference from long-range jammers in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries, plus reinforcement in big cities by local jammers. Mieczysław Petruski, former head of the control department of Polish radio and television, remembers a brand new type of jamming appeared in 1971. Until then, jamming resembled a buzzing industrial interference. From 1971, music started to play in the background of Radio Free Europe's programs. It became more and more loud, and finally the program of Free Europe occurred in the shadow. What happened? Earlier, it was easy to identify noise as a deliberate jamming. So it was decided to let people listen to the music. Everything was arranged very smartly. In Warsaw, at Polish radio, there were recorded tapes with such kind of music that nobody would suspect to be Russian. This music is still sounding in my ears. Such melody as Flight of Bee, Little Flower, and many others. This music was transmitted by cable from Warsaw to transmitters in the Soviet Union. At the beginning, these Soviet jamming services were provided for free, or maybe it was a barter, but later Poland was demanded to pay. Moscow issued bills for jamming to Warsaw. On its side, Poland decided to check the quality of such imported jamming. For this purpose, Poland requested to identify the Soviet jamming radio centers in operation. Music, and later, the speech resembling signal every minute was interrupted by two-letter call signs in Morse code. Poland used them for evaluation of signals of the particular jammers. Poland, as well as Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia, transmitted jamming noise towards the Soviet Union. The efficiency of the cross-border jamming was monitored at the receiving center near Stanislavov, 40 kilometers east of Warsaw. REF's Polish language programs were blocked by eight high-power shortwave radio centers near Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, Kuybyshev, Sverdlovsk, and elsewhere. Poland paid back with barter jamming of the broadcast beamed at the USSR. There are two or three such export jamming sites in Poland. From June of 1963 to August of 1968, and from September of 1973 to August of 1980, when the political climate in Europe became warmer, the Soviet Union would stop jamming government stations of London, Cologne, and Washington. The jamming would return with a powerful howl after the Czechoslovakian and Polish crises. For the purpose of propaganda, Moscow temporarily stopped the jamming of the BBC, the Voice of America, and Deutsche Welle between the visit of Nikita Khrushchev to Britain and the Hungarian crisis in 1956, during Khrushchev's visit to the U.S. in 1959, and once more in early 1960, after the U-2 incident, jamming was resumed. In 1963, Radio Free Europe and The Voice of America started broadcasting from Munich on a long wave frequency which was already used by the Soviet Union. Moscow took the position that their channel was being jammed. A one million watt American powerhouse was switched off 
in 1973 when the USSR temporarily stopped jamming the Voice of America. When it started transmissions in Russian from Munich on AM radio, the USSR tried to block out the unwanted signal by launching on the same channel a Mayak radio network in Belarus. Jamming has been a subject of debate in the United Nations and other international forums since 1950 when the Soviet ambassador to the UN, Andrei Vyshinsky, justified jamming BBC broadcasts by saying that they were filled with lies and that they had to be jammed because the Soviet people might become so upset that relations between the USSR and the UK would suffer. In August of 1972, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko presented a draft resolution to the UN which had implications for all types of broadcasting but directly concerned television. It proposed making direct satellite broadcast illegal without the consent of the receiving country. Nicknamed the Jammers Charter and opposed to by the US, the Soviets proposed the same measure to the UN Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space after it failed in the General Assembly. The radio war in the 80s reached unprecedented heights. Radio Liberty had as many as 20 frequencies in use for the Russian language service. There were plans to increase the number of the simultaneous channels up to 40. The station operated transmitters in West Germany, Portugal, and Spain. The Voice of America transmitted to the Soviet Union from Germany, Greece, the UK, and Morocco. The US built a new high power station in Maxiqueira, Portugal. There were plans to erect new relay bases in Israel, Sri Lanka, and Turkey. In its turn, the USSR planned to construct the new long-haul jamming centers in Syria and Vietnam. For over 30 years, the Western countries and the USSR held an ongoing debate about radio jamming. The Western arguments were, everyone has the right to seek, receive, and impart information through any media and regardless of frontiers. Jamming of radio broadcast is condemned as a denial of the right of all persons to be fully informed concerning news, opinions, and ideas. The answer from Moscow was that the sovereignty of the USSR in the field of radio broadcasting secures for the USSR the possibility and rights to sever a radio aggression directed against her by air. The USSR entirely jammed programs of seven foreign broadcasters, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, The Voice of America, the BBC, The Voice of Israel, Radio Tirana from Albania, Radio Beijing, and Radio of South Korea. Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Poland, and East Germany were also actively jamming Western radio programs. In the 50s and 60s, the jamming activities were noticed in Romania, Hungary, and Yugoslavia as well. The effectiveness of jamming ranged from minor annoyance to total blockage. Sigitis Zhilonis, a Lithuanian radio consultant and historian, remembers.
in 81 big cities of the USSR were low power so-called ground wave jammers with about 15 transmitters per station. Their power usually was 5 kilowatts, the effective range up to 30 kilometers. For coverage of the large rural territory laying between towns and not reached by the local jammers, there were 13 high power sky wave jamming centers with 10 or more transmitters in each site. Their effective operational range was up to two to 3,000 kilometers. The power of these jammers usually was 100 or 200 kilowatts. In some cases, it reached 1,000 kilowatts. In the small Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, there were 11 jamming stations in all major cities totaling about 140 transmitters. The low power jammers were numbered with 60 series like object number 61 in the Seaport Klaipeda. The mid-sized stations were numbered with 600 series like object number 603 in Kaunas. There were 90 jamming transmitters in Belarus and as many as 300 units in the Ukraine. Ironically, the jammed foreign broadcasters were called communications correspondents. The best way to jam is to transmit the interference from the same direction as the radio wave of the unwanted signal. Therefore, the sky wave jammers were built across the perimeter of the empire of noise near Krasnodar, Yerevan, Nikolaev, Lvov, Almata, Kishinev, Kaliningrad, Novosibirsk, Tashkent, Habarovsk, Kuybyshev, Sverdlovsk, and Moscow. The Skywave jammers had the rhombic or the vertical curtain array type antennas beamed at many regions of the large country. The local jammers were equipped with the multi-wire omnidirectional dipoles. What did the radio censorship cost the Soviets and other nations supervised by the Empire of Noise? Some experts estimate that three to five million U.S. dollars were spent by the whole Soviet bloc annually. Direction finding data indicating the locations and call signs of the Soviet and East European jamming stations is shown on the map. The cost of jamming a specific territory was several times higher than it was to broadcast a radio program to the same target area. In contrast to Russia, the Czech Republic has disclosed archived documents on jamming. At least 20 million crowns were spent annually on radio defense. This country, as well as Bulgaria and the USSR, were the most severe jammers in the bloc of Warsaw Pact nations. A huge AM jamming network of 300 transmitters operated in East Germany. The system was targeted against the programs of RIAS, radio in the American sector of West Berlin. GDR jammed RIAS from 1952 to 1978. The only long jamming war in the West was during the Cyprus crisis in the late 50s when Athens jammed London's broadcast and London jammed Athens broadcast. Another application of jamming by the free world occurred during the Rhodesian crisis of 1965-66. France jammed the French language program from Nazi Germany. Madrid jammed the Soviet foreign broadcast in Spanish in the 40s. Pinochet's Chile jammed programs of Radio Moscow. There were reports about jamming in Egypt, Israel, Turkey, Italy, and Japan. The Soviet jamming network exceeded all the others. In the 50s and 60s, they jammed even such stations as Radio Vatican, External Radio of Spain, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, ORTF from Paris, Radio Yugoslavia, and Radio Rome. Vladimir Zurin is a chief engineer of an AM radio station in Vilnius. In the Soviet times, this transmitting center was occasionally used for jamming at certain hours when the local jammer, object number 600, was not able to cover all frequencies of the Western broadcasters. Mr. Zurin demonstrates the usual tuning procedure of the five kilowatt transmitter, which was used both for communications and jamming. 
Those who used to monitor the dial and were patient enough could often find holes in the jamming wall. Some of the foreign broadcasters liked to be deceptive. Radio Beijing used to change its frequency slightly during the broadcast, leaving the hoarse choir of jammers aside. On certain channels, Chinese played back their Russian broadcast backwards. They expected listeners to record the programs and then to play it back in reverse. The backwards frequencies of Radio Beijing were not jammed. The receivers made for the Soviet domestic market intentionally did not include the 13, 16, and 19 meter shortwave bands because the jamming on these bands was less effective. However, many listeners had their radios privately adapted for the reception of the higher bands. Irena Litguvina was a radio monitor of the jammer in Konis, Lithuania. We controlled the air and issued orders for the transmitting station to tune up the transmitters. At our receiving station, three operators were working in shifts 12 hours by night or 12 hours at daytime. Our duty was to scan shortwave frequencies to find the audible foreign radio stations. We received the encrypted schedule from Moscow by telegraph line or by radio in Morse code. We deciphered these messages using a one-time pad key. The schedules were valid, usually for one month. On our desk were communications receivers R-250. Our supervisor was a woman. She controlled our work. I was an ordinary operator. I just needed to check the frequencies provided by Moscow. Every jammer consisted of two parts, transmitting and receiving. The transmitting part was officially called a radio communications station or object number 603. The monitoring site was known as a receiving station or a control and correction post. There were a couple of direct telephone lines between the listening post and the transmitting station. The jamming signal was fed to the transmitters by the dedicated telephone lines. The control and correction post were installed about five kilometers from the city jammers. Usually there were two working positions equipped with professional communications receivers. The jamming targets were also traced by the central monitoring station of the second radio directorate of the Ministry of Communications in Moscow. Generators of Interference was the title of an article that appeared in Posev, the Russian immigrant magazine. The anonymous author worked at a Soviet jamming station and had defected to the West. Quote, Among new personnel is an incredible turnover. Those include young fellows just out of the army, many of them having served in signals. They think that it will be work connected with technology, but they see that it is repulsive to which they have no heart for. Only the women stay behind. The whole monitoring depends on them. They listen to the broadcast with headphones. There is a direct link with the transmitting site. The operator calls to the transmitter hall. Get a transmitter number five ready on 7220 from 1700. The transmitter guys tune the units. The women of the receiving station switch them on and off by remote control. Lithuanian seaport of Klaipeda, 
the communist authorities decided to install a local jamming station at a Jewish cemetery. In the second largest city in Lithuania, Konas, jamming object number 603 was based in the old citadel. When the empire of noise collapsed, many low-powered jammers were dismantled. In Cholet, the premises of the jammer was converted into a cafe. In the capital, Vilnius, the building of object number 600 was converted into the headquarters of the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority. In Soviet times, there were many buildings such as funeral houses and sports palaces built in place of the old monuments, graveyards, and not only Jewish, for them was just an empty space suitable for new construction. I also grew in the family among radio receivers. I would not clearly understand what was going on, but some bits of information would stick into my memory. When I started listening consciously, the day spent without radio would seem not full, as if lacking something. When working as a taxi driver, I would return home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. This was the most suitable time for listening, as jamming sometime was less intensive. To catch Radio Liberty was a great joy. It was the most difficult to hear. Deutsche Welle, the BBC, and the Voice of America were not jammed so carefully. in Russia and other CIS countries, some of the jamming transmitters were leased out to broadcast the same foreign radio programs they once jammed, such as Radio Liberty, the BBC, or the Voice of America. The mid-sized jamming station in Balashika near Moscow was switched to broadcast domestic radio programs of the 15 Soviet republics. According to an old Soviet standard, the towers of the jamming stations were painted in camouflage colors, yellow and black. From 1975 onward, all radio and TV towers in the USSR, including those of the jamming facilities, were painted in white and red. At night, the jamming towers were illuminated with non-blinking red lights. People living close to these secret jamming objects were subjected to strong electromagnetic fields. Measurement data proved that their worries were grounded. However, this information was stored in folders marked secret and was not available to the public. In addition, the high power jamming signals made their way onto the circuits of tape recorders and record players. Officials used to emphasize that the country's ideological safety was the highest priority and that people must be patient with the noise. In the Soviet Union, even ordinary radio broadcasting stations were ready for jamming as the reserve facilities. Petrus Leskavichus, retired engineer of the Tsitkune radio station in central Lithuania, remembers, I have been working in Tsitkune since 1964. At this time, jamming was performed mostly on short waves, but the jamming equipment was also installed on our medium wave station. If we would receive a command, we would start to jam. The jamming equipment Zenith was connected to the old 150 kilowatt AM broadcast transmitter. Later, it was moved to the new 500 kilowatt transmitter. Besides, after World War II, there were two shortwave transmitters installed, each 50 kilowatts, captured by the Red Army from Germany. There were several shortwave antennas beamed virtually to all directions. All this transmitting equipment was suitable both for broadcasting Radio Moscow's programs and for jamming as a backup facility if needed. I'm happy to tell you that I wasn't involved personally in jamming activities at any time. Jamming accelerated the decline of Soviet prestige since it was heard all over the globe. Listeners in many countries knew that this cacophony was made in the USSR. At the height of perestroika, many jamming veterans were in shock when they suddenly got Moscow's command to switch off the equipment. There were a lot of elderly people that were able to retire. 
the young engineers could find jobs in normal broadcasting stations. Many people were praying during the attempted coups in Moscow to keep the hardline communists from returning to power. If they win in Russia, someday the dinosaurs of the Cold War would pollute the radio spectrum once again. In August of 1991, during the communist coup in Moscow, Soviet troops stationed in Lithuania started jamming the first program of Lithuanian radio on medium wave. The Soviet military used recordings of Ala Pugacheva and other popular Russian artists to jam the radio signal coming from Vilnius. In the evening of November 29, 1988, at 2100 hours UTC, midnight Moscow time, the USSR ceased to jam Radio Liberty, The Voice of Israel, Radio Free Afghanistan, and Deutsche Welle. The jamming session that lasted for 40 years was over. Anatoly Batyuskin, one of the former administrators of the Soviet jamming system, wrote in 1997, all employees who have had a direct relationship with this work are now retired pensioners. All jamming sites have either been converted to other purposes or have had their equipment written off. All related technical and operational documentation no longer exist. Even today, very limited information is available from the Russian officials. Professional and amateur radio monitors of the world are familiar with jamming since the beginning of the 21st century. Bernd Trutenau, a journalist and expert in international radio broadcasting, explains. Among those countries which still are conducting jamming in a larger scale are China, Vietnam, Cuba and Iran. And the target of those uh, jamming transmissions are especially broadcasts from uh, America, from uh, stations that are financed by the US government. For example, uh, Radio Free Asia, which is broadcasting to Iran, like transmissions of uh, Radio Free Asia uh, for China and Vietnam, or Radio Marti for Cuba, or Radio Farda for Iran. In addition to that, uh, China also jams some uh, language services of the BBC and Deutsche Welle. Jammer is a kind of uh, jamming system which is used especially in Cuba, Iran and Middle East. Uh, it means that a kind of noise, uh, actually it's a swinging carrier, uh, is transmitted on the frequency of the foreign station. China, uh, the jamming is done in such a way that uh, actually a Chinese radio program or music uh, is put on the same frequencies as the stations that should be jammed. The listeners of Radio Free Asia can find on the website of this station instructions on how to make an anti-jamming. Rotate the board to different angles until you find the best reception. Keep the board away from your body to limit the effect your body will have on the radio's reception. What you are doing by rotating the board is trying to block the interfering signal while keeping the desired signal strong. There is no information available on the massive use of jamming in North Korea. The reason why the fierce totalitarian regime does not need power for jamming is that nobody is allowed to own a personal radio set with a shortwave band. This is reminiscent of the Stalin area in the Soviet Union. During World War II, anyone who was found possessing one single radio tube, not to mention a whole radio set, might find himself in the gulag pretty soon. The government of China retains strict control over the internet. During the past two years, Beijing has passed regulations prohibiting information that incites subversive acts to overthrow the state or includes unauthorized news and comments. Access to the websites of some Western radio stations is restricted. 
Since May of 2003, the Iranian government is blocking the websites of The Voice of America, Radio Farda, and other sites that are political or deemed immoral. Some 15,000 websites were targeted in Iran. And what about television jamming? American TV Marti broadcast to Cuba from the air balloon called Fat Albert floating over South Florida. To extend the interference range, Castro's engineers equipped several Soviet-made helicopters with jamming transmitters. In 2003, the Cuban government denied that it is jamming an American satellite TV broadcast to Iran. The interference was discovered when the Voice of America launched a Persian language program beamed to Iran. A California-based private Iranian television station has also had its signal jammed. It has been reported that in 1997, Med TV, the Kurdish satellite television station, suffered deliberate interference on its test transmissions by way of UTELSAT. The jamming destroyed Med TV's program with a noisy dark screen. The World Tibet Network News reported in 1997, quote, the Chinese authorities have stepped up the jamming of foreign radio broadcast in Tibet following the allocation of increased resources by Beijing in an attempt to prevent infiltration of the airways by foreign hostile forces. In December of 2002, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the agency that oversees U.S. international broadcasting, said virtually all shortwave transmissions directed to China by The Voice of America and Radio Free Asia are jammed. In October of 2002, the BBC World Service confirmed that China had been doing a cross-border jamming of its Uzbek service for several months. In response to the independent news coverage of opposition protest by the private radio station B92 in Belgrade, the Serbian government began to jam its signals. There were more cases of jamming in Yugoslavia when the FM signals of Radio Jasenica and of other independent broadcasters were blocked before the upcoming elections and other important political events. Jamming was a very frustrating and infuriating thing. On the other hand, due to it, the value of the information seemed greater. I was using all kinds of tricks against jamming. For instance, I would connect a radio set's antenna to the heating radiator's pipe, and it really improved the sound for a while. There were other ways as well. For example, I would listen to radio programs not in Russian, but in the Polish language. Once, at 5.30 a.m., I caught the voice of America in Ukrainian. I still remember the names of those who worked at the microphones. Governments that make use of jamming argue that they have the right to protect their citizens from destructive propaganda. The internet provides unlimited opportunities to distribute information and ideas. Paradoxically, because of this, too much freedom, governments are debating ways to block out what to their thinking are dangerous messages for their societies. It was reported that the EU institutions are studying the legal and technical possibilities to censor the internet. Eventually, the service providers would be required to use a special filtering technology for eliminating servers of racism and pornography.